Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's webinar for, um, in the NACTO webinar series. Today, we are talking about making transit count. Uh, my name is Aaron Villery. I'm a senior program associate with NACTO, and I'm really excited to introduce our panelists. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about the topic. Um, and uh, this topic is about how cities and transit agencies can support transit improvements um, by telling a more complete story about their streets and about transit service. Um, Cities that succeed at implementing transit street projects uh, do so because they are able to make a strong case uh, that resonates about uh, investing in transit. And what uh, we measure informs the choices we make and um, the opportunities that we can capture to actually improve transit in our cities. Um, we're also using this opportunity to premiere a new resource paper from NACTO called Making Transit Count, which is now available on NACTO's website, which is nacto.org. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll chat out a link for that during the webinar uh, today. But we're really excited to premiere this paper and, and, and invite the three panelists that we have today. Um, some quick housekeeping before uh, we go forward. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be sent out, uh, I think, a day after the, the webinar completes. So tomorrow, you'll, uh, since you've registered, you'll receive that link to the recording. Um, and with that, without further ado, I want to introduce our three panelists uh, and give the, the run of show for the day. So we'll be hearing from uh, NACTO's own Matthew Rowe, the director of the Designing Cities Initiative, to talk about uh, this new resource paper, Making Transit Count. Um, then we'll hear from John Levin, who joins us from Metro Transit in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, who's going to talk about um, how they're uh, leveraging transit data to build the case and, and to do uh, better project identification and development internally within their agency. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from David Cooperman and Scott Frazier from the City of Toronto to talk about their very exciting King Street Transit pilot, uh, which no doubt many of you have heard about. Um, so with that, uh, I want to introduce uh, my colleague and the director of the Designing Cities Initiative, uh, Matthew Rowe. Uh, so Matthew leads the uh, NACTO street design work in North America. He oversaw the, the development of the Transit Street Design Guide, which was released in 2016, and he works with all of NACTO's peer networks to spread good ideas, connect people in places, and build design knowledge. He loves working with cities and bringing street designs to life at every project stage and uh, has a lot of experience doing this. So with that, I'm really excited to hand it over uh, to my colleague, Matthew, um, who is going to tell us about the resource paper. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Rowe. Um, it's great to be with you here today. I'm going to talk about how to uh, use NACTO's newest publication, Making Transit Count, to counter some classic false narratives about transit. Street Design Guide and the Transit Street Design Guide, NACTO established some very general guidance about street performance measures uh, centered on the themes of safety, mobility, and access to the whole city, and economic vitality. Um, kind of the central themes of the Urban Street Design Guide that carried through to the Transit Street Design Guide, including public space as the heart of how we evaluate streets. Since then, we have experienced not only revolution in design, but also revolution in data. You've all pushed much further with your projects in your cities, and your projects call for a much more comprehensive approach to data that gets at the rider value provided by transit projects on the street. We're going to hear today from two cities, Toronto and Minneapolis, that have done exactly that. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about why we're here. Um, we're all listening probably because we already see transit projects as safety projects, as mobility projects, as equity and efficiency and reliability projects, and as enhancements to public space and the civic sphere. But we don't always collect data that let us talk about them that way. Our values matter, and our cities tend to be driven by values, but informed by data. We have all these things that we care about, and we have all this data, but somehow, like a saltwater ocean, there's not a drop of the right kind right when you need it. Partially, this is because of the inherited metrics that the transportation industry has relied on for so long. Um, the measures we often use for streets and even for transit so often render the people riding transit invisible. Whether we're talking about how many vehicles we move on a street or how little delay they have, 
or reducing the total number of collisions versus injuries, or um, uh, right, or minimizing delay, we often just exclude the transit rider's real experience. And one of the main jobs of performance measures is to help insert facts back into the public discussion, um, countering the kind of false narratives that can emerge so naturally when these are the only pieces of information available. It's perfectly natural if all you see is a change from LOSC to LOSD on the city's report about a project, it's pretty natural to think that it got worse, that it made things worse. Um, that's one of the reasons that we need much more careful, intentional, comprehensive data. Um, so unfortunately, for a long time, we've had pretty detailed guidance on some very vehicle-oriented measures. Uh, the Highway Capacity Manual is this amazingly complex, well-funded tool that you're probably a little too familiar with if you've ever done an environmental impact statement. And in part because of that official gloss, we often feel as if we need to use its method, which is essentially level of service um, uh, for motor vehicles only um, in order to measure all of our projects. And the thing is, it's really just vehicle delay. That's the core of what it does, even in its multimodal versions. So when we use it, we're doing ourselves a disservice, especially on transit projects. Now, that's not to say that there aren't valid uses for, uh, for motor vehicle delay. One of the most important ones in a transit project um, can be uh, understanding where long queues might form and where transit signal priority might be most helpful or where transit lanes might be most helpful. But it's really just a product development um, tool at best. It's not a performance measure. It doesn't tell you if you've gone from LOS A to LOS B or LOS A to LOS D, you might have actually improved the street while doing that. So it doesn't really tell you enough about how well you're doing your job. Um, put simply, we need more information about people, not vehicles. Um, the TCQSM, the Transit Capacity and Service Manual, Quality Manual, is good for a lot of things and people use it for a lot of things, but um, it's pretty difficult to use the measures that are uh, included there to communicate with the public. And it's sometimes even hard for us to use them internally. So NACTO's Making Transit Count paper is different in three ways. It's a best practice paper, and it doesn't try to boil everything down to one number, but instead it uses key categories, six key categories, that hopefully will get you and your partner agencies thinking about how best to measure each of those categories. And it gives us options at multiple levels. There are different measures that you can create from the same relatively common uh, data sources. Some of them are easier or more complex to use than others, but that's intentional. There are also some that are at lower or higher levels of uh, network analysis. That's intentional, thinking about individual streets or an entire transit network or an entire street network or an individual stop. Those are all important parts of the work we do. Um, and third, the paper's measures get as close as possible to the people that are at the heart of all transit performance. Let's talk about these false narratives that we so often confront. The first one, if you're considering implementing transit lanes, driving is probably also already a, a pretty bad experience on that street. Um, but how transit projects affect drivers is a lot more nuanced, and it's going to be different in different places. Without firm data, we'll all assume the worst. Second, there's an easy assumption it'll hurt small businesses it's always a small and struggling business that pipes up even though it's been there for a long time and somehow one parking spot will, uh, will end it. Um, we all care about neighborhood businesses, but it's such, a key, um, it's such a key area where the needs and perceptions might differ that we just have to insert data into that conversation. And finally, a sort of collection, a constellation of myths that all surround transit. You can call them whatever you want. You could call them um, user heuristics or elite projection, but even in the biggest transit cities in the world, you have to call it the bluff. You always seem to get all of these questions and preferably you can use ridership data to counter them. Um, we have to especially confront misperceptions about capacity versus congestion and push back against this idea that sort of only when transit passengers are just as miserable as car commuters have we achieved some form of equity. 
Um, about that, folks. And finally, those kind of add up to this sum of, well, we don't need to invest in transit because maybe the, the robots will take over or maybe um, things just don't, things just aren't going to matter as much in the future. It's sort of a, a strange approach. But there are hard questions that we need to answer. And they're perfectly serious questions that we get about projects. Will the benefits outweigh the costs? Will it get safer? What kind of changes to traffic patterns can we anticipate? And what about all of our other goals? Those might be safety goals. They might be providing high quality bike facilities. They might be goals about pedestrian access. Are we talking about a good use of money? These are all important questions. So let's confront these myths. Each of these metrics is really about subverting a false narrative. So instead of measuring number of vehicles moved, we measure the number of people moved. Instead of measuring strictly collisions, we measure systemic safety, especially focusing on, um, on fatalities and severe injuries, which is a much fairer measure across modes. And finally, focusing on reliability of travel, which is a concept that can be fairly applied across all modes. We can measure access to walking and biking. How are we getting riders to and from the transit stop? And how are we providing both complementary mobility and alternatives to transit? How are our streets providing social and economic opportunities that we want them to provide and need them to provide? And how are they adding up to becoming better places to be? So let's dig in and help confront some of these narratives. So <laughs> you might say, Oh, well, look at that street. You're taking away a lane. So too often reassigning street space is framed in these kind of deficit terms, um, removing capacity. We have to show that the street actually moves a lot more people as a safe, transit-friendly, and active street than as a, a peak hour parking lot and an off-peak speedway. One way to do that is to start by showing at a basic level, and I think it's really one of the most important things that a transit project can do, is to show the link between how the project actually works and how it makes the bus move better in traffic on the street. So you don't always have immediate 20 minute savings on a given project, but you probably do have data that shows improved reliability, even if the average didn't move dramatically. And in this example, there's a clear link between the implementation of Alder Boarding, a project initiated by the Transit Agency, and Bus Lanes and Transit Signal Priority, a project managed by the Department of Transportation in New York. That combination of MTA and New York City DOT working together resulted in these savings of time. And one interesting thing about this is that you can also start to talk about the fact that the time savings don't really come from making a bus physically faster. The time in motion has stayed about the same. You have to work to talk about these together. These come from multiple sources. Some agencies might have automated vehicle location data or even automated passenger counts. But even if you don't have automated data, you still have the ability to do old fashioned time studies. And those can be very, very effective, um, especially in the first projects on the, on the street. Um, Here's an example of how Seattle talks about its uh, uh, traffic street redesign projects. On the Dexter Avenue example shown here, a four-lane cross-section became two lanes, but the street moves more people in all modes than it did before, with negligible differences to travel times. The data counteracts the false narrative about taking something away, because effective transit unlocks capacity and is compatible with efficient movement. Back in New York, when you do talk about motor vehicle travel, you've got to talk about what people really want, which is reliable movement. This is an example from the Bronx. Um, it was actually that photo I showed earlier of, uh, of that street where every, nothing seemed to be moving. Instead of putting the project in terms of vehicle delay or level of service, the project was analyzed through nominal travel time. It's easy to understand. Um, once vehicle delay enters the narrative, it'll tilt kind of that whole project doesn't mean don't ever do modeling or a delay calculation. It just means don't talk about it so much. It's not the main thing that people care about. They really care about 
is whether their 20-minute commute suddenly become a half-hour commute. And in many places, any change that's made will automatically trigger some voices who will say, my 20-minute drive became a 30-minute drive. We have to recognize that as an industry and actually come equipped with data. Don't come to a data fight with just words. We actually need, um, we actually need the travel time data. In this case, actual average travel vehicle travel time over the corridor actually decreased slightly, in part because um, the uh, added transit lanes effectively removed some of the double parking that was going on. But more importantly, framing as corridor travel time makes the change both a lot more understandable and just a lot more tolerable. A minute plus or minus for vehicles is probably worth it, especially when you can improve travel for the thousands of people riding the bus, in this case, many more than are in cars. And when you start to do that, you can start to also create um, metrics of safety that are proximate metrics, things that you can collect immediately and that are early indicators for how well you're serving pedestrians on the street who are ultimately your riders. Bringing streets in line with efficient transit speed and movement can bring safety co-benefits and talking about these changes in traffic movement and safety terms is very resonant most people, even drivers, would agree that 40 mile per hour travel speeds are inappropriate on a street like this and implicitly understand that reducing the number of speeding vehicles means safer streets. Note, we're not talking about 85th percentile speeds. We're talking about the number of people, individuals, who are driving far over the speed limit. And that remarkable decrease is simply the result of better redesign. So let's talk about businesses. Um, we know that local businesses are the growth engines of our cities. Our streets and public spaces are built around social and economic access, including to retail, and we're 100% correct to be sensitive to how our projects impact them. But this idea that it'll destroy my business, it's a charge that's pretty commonly leveled against transformative projects. That's one that we just need to counteract with data, because somehow when, uh, when motor vehicle traffic work is being done, this doesn't usually come up. Um, it's somehow only when we're talking about modes that small business owners are less likely to take to work um, that we start hearing about this. Local movement powers local economic growth, though, and transit streets unlock local movement. So first off, let's try to put it to rest. Transit does not kill small businesses. It supports them. And the popular image of driving to a store just isn't reality. Um, it's very, very difficult to get a very large number of people to an urban street by car. And no matter where the work is done, we've seen an increase in sales tax receipts when a good transit project has been implemented, when transit travel times decrease and when reliability improves. So this is one of the main ways to counter that. Use sales tax receipts if you've got them. Focus on locally owned businesses, if you can do that. But if you can't, then start thinking about how people get to the street. This is a type of survey work that can be done um, much more uh, locally and before a project is done. to Start to demonstrate that customers are getting to a street by other modes. Many of you have seen these kinds of studies, but it's important to realize that you might even still be underestimating the number of people getting to a main street by foot, by bike, and by transit. Because even on streets with a very high number of motor vehicles driving through, a pretty low number of those motor vehicle drivers are stopping on that street, a much higher percentage of people walking, taking the bus, taking the train, and biking are going to be doing that. So in this example from Vancouver, arrivals to business, uh, an arrivals to business survey revealed that more than 80% of people on commercial streets did not arrive by private motor vehicle. When more people can arrive, more people can shop. Um, finally, a recurring theme on transit projects is the need for curb space management. Um, this is one of the things that you can start to talk about when you've got good data about, um, about arrival patterns. And we have to counter this notion that tech will somehow automatically solve congestion and simultaneously that nobody takes the bus. So I'm wrapping them together because they really are often generated by the same kind of assumption. It's the, it's the I don't take the bus, nobody else does. But when cities invest in service and street design, 
transit flourishes, reliability improves, and ridership increases. These things go together, the service, the street, and the reliability, all leading to better ridership. We know because we have data. This one from Seattle. It's important to show progress over time. Seattle built its rapid ride network out. It got substantial increases in ridership. A lot of its well-noted and well, um, well-deserved well attention for, um, for improvements in ridership have actually been concentrated on just a small number of lines where a lot of the work has been done. And ultimately, if we're analyzing how, uh, if we're trying to work on ridership and we're analyzing how service works with an eye toward improving ridership, we're going to be focusing on riders. Riders care about reliability. They don't care about the schedule unless we're talking about routes with 20 minute headways. Travel time matters to riders, but reliability can't be separated from it. And that's a really important point. The slowest travel time is the one that riders have to plan for. So from my perspective as a rider, bunching is the observable problem that leads to most of the other problems, right? And this is something that your riders can relate to. A late bus or a train keeps getting later, is more people to try to cram on, eventually you get pass ups and other kinds of service failures. Each minute of waiting feels three times as long as a minute riding and being 50% late in effect doubles that average wait time that experience of people who arrived expecting to take that bus that's late now. But conventional on-time performance measures won't really tell you that. It's not really enough to be less than five minutes late when you've got an eight or a 10 minute headway. Um, as we'll hear next to Metro Transit, um, headway-based uh, performance concepts can really change the way that you serve riders. In the big picture, the way you see the city as an experienced transit rider isn't just as a network or even as fast or slow sections of a trip. It's really a map of how long it takes you to go places. And that's three things, getting to transit, waiting, and then time on the vehicle. These things, the walk, the wait, the ride, add up to a trip. And if there's a shortcoming in one, the whole trip can be compromised in terms of reliability. So the big picture reliability metrics we use as a transit city should really get to all these things. With a hat tip to Chris Pangolinen, who I believe first represented this idea in the United States, though I'd be happy to learn more if anyone else has earlier examples, you can communicate and measure all these forms of reliability together with two maps, where you can go in a certain amount of time by walking plus transit on the best and worst days of the week. The best and worst days of the week. That's a 15th percentile travel time and an 85th percentile travel time in the same network um, representing roughly the best out of six and the worst out of six days. If you already have the data, it's not that difficult. And it's an easy way to communicate how the city actually looks to somebody riding transit. It's especially important if your decision makers don't ride transit that much. As you collect and add data on things like accessibility, you can tweak the pedestrian network underneath it to show how sidewalk availability or station access affects the distance reaching power of your riders on your network. And you can even start to use these types of measures to evaluate what would happen if you reduce the travel time on a key part of the network. There's so much that we can do now that wasn't available to us just a few years ago. And there are a lot of other folks who are doing pretty sophisticated analysis related to travel time. So I'm going to turn it over um, to uh, Aaron, who will introduce John as we hear from our cities. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Um, so I want to, uh, I uh, failed to mention one housekeeping note, which is please enter questions into the question box uh, throughout the webinar, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. But uh, feel free to answer those freely as we go, and, and we'll catch up um, at the end of the webinar and have some time to discuss. Um, next, I'm excited to hand uh, the reins over to John Levin, who is the Director of Strategic Partnerships uh, or Strategic Initiatives at Metro Transit in Minneapolis, St. Paul. In this role, Mr. Levin oversees performance measurement, data analytics, and research activities and coordination of shared mobility initiatives. He's been working with Metro Transit for 20 years, working on long range system planning, route planning, service analysis, scheduling, and data collection for the agency's bus and rail service. 
Uh, so with that, uh, John, I will uh, let you take the reins. All right. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Aaron. Um, and uh, thank you for having me on the webinar today. I'm looking forward to it. And I really think that the the report that um, <clears throat> Matthew was sharing really resonates well with uh, the work that we're doing here in the Twin Cities. So I'm looking forward uh, in this next few minutes to sharing several of our efforts here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region. And I'm certainly happy to uh, share any of the stuff on this slide as well. We've got uh, plenty of it left uh, around on the ground these days. Um, I'll, what I'll be doing today is sharing three examples of how we are using data and performance measures. Uh, and they're all somewhat different with uh, different types of data and different audiences, but they all come back to our core focus, which is meeting the needs of our customers and building effective transit into the fabric of the city or the cities. For our customers, effective transit means being able to get where they want to go quick, quickly and reliably. And in our context, this requires a continual reevaluation of service to identify bottlenecks and, and other challenges as, as things change on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis. So monitoring performance, that is monitoring our speed and our reliability and many other indicators is an essential first step of that process. But the real question is that we need, you know, we need to answer is, uh, what are we going to do about it? How do we fix problems when service quality deteriorates? And those answers are the ones that require a deeper understanding of what is happening with our service. And it also requires partnerships with cities and other roadway managers as we uh, seek uh, shared solutions. So this presentation will cover a little bit of all of this. I'll talk about one of our newest performance measures, which is headway performance and how it reflects our service reliability. Uh, I'll talk about um, one example of um, how we're using data uh, on tr transit share of person throughput to inform our collaboration with cities. And I'll also provide an example of a new tool we're using uh, to really dig deep into our data to understand the sources of transit delay and opportunities for improvement. So like many agencies, we have long used, um, transit agencies, we've long used on-time performance as a key measure of service reliability. And, and, and really simply on-time performance just means that you're measuring whether the bus or train left when the schedule said it would. Uh, but when you operate high frequency service, as Matt was saying, with every 10 or 15 minutes or better, customers tend to pay less attention to the schedule and are often interested if the buses come regularly. And that was Matt's point. Um, and that way, you know, you can show up at the stop and you know a bus will be along. Uh, a couple years ago, we started to look at alternative measures of service reliability to see if there's other ways beyond on-time performance. And we quickly found is that when you start to explore this question, you find many different possible measures. Uh, they pile up like snow in a spring blizzard, I like to say. Uh, we took a close look at all of them to see which, really, uh, which ones really best met our specific needs. And the things that we were looking at specifically were um, whether we, we really wanted a performance measure that would reveal a different perspective or insight into our service as a compared to on-time performance. We wanted one that would reflect the experience of our customers using the service something that would be easy to understand and explain, especially on the operations side, and also one that would be feasible to, to, to calculate with our existing data. A lot of the measures that we looked, la looked at really required some of the data that we, we didn't actually have available to us. So the measure that we chose to use is headway performance. And in short, it's a measure of how the actual time in between buses, on a, uh, and buses or train on a route, that would be the headway of the service. Um, how often uh, the actual times are within a reasonable time of the scheduled service. Um, so I've got a little example here. Um, so we've got our buses and they're, they're scheduled to come about 10 minutes apart. And so as the service day begins, the buses show up on time and our customers are happy because the buses are on time and we're maintaining that even headway. And now the bus comes late um, and we have this 18 minute gap in service. And that's when our customers start to get unhappy on this frequent service. And in particular, it's not just a late bus, but it's the gap in service that really drives them crazy. Um, the next bus comes, it's also a little bit late, but again, this customer probably didn't wait very long because the gap in between those buses was relatively small. So no matter when they showed up, the bus came and our service continues on over the course of the day. Um, and so kind of into the details of the specific metric that we've chosen to use here um, is the percent of, um, the percent of observed headways or observed gaps in between buses within 140% of the scheduled headway, the scheduled gap. Uh, so for example, uh, when we had a 10 minute headway or a 10 minute service, um, that would mean that the trips are arriving 
uh, with less than a 14 minute gap in between them. Those will be the ones that would meet our sta standard. And, and all of all, all in all, this standard is, is a little bit harder to calculate uh, than on time performance, but we find in particular that it reflects the customer experience, especially for our high frequency services. And so I'll give an example of that. Um, uh, in, with, with our bus service. So this is a chart of the on-time frequency over the last few years, or on-time performance, I'm sorry, over the last few years of our high-frequency service that operates every 15 minutes or better. And what you can see in this chart clearly is that seasonal variation in our service. And during the summer, when we have lots of construction and special events and detours. Our on-time performance tends to suffer actually more significantly than it does during the winter when you might expect that snow would be in our way, but that tends to clear up and, and isn't a problem. So if we layer onto this chart our headway performance at that 140% standard, one thing you can really see is that um, even though the even when the buses are late, we're still managing to operate a reasonably um, even headway. And what we can also see in this chart is that the headway performance tends to be less volatile. I mean, let, not moving up and down as much as on-time performance. So when on-time performance goes up, um, the headway goes up, but not as much. And the same thing when on-time performance drops. And I think this reflects two things. So the first is that when the buses are running late, um, if all the trips are equally late, we're still maintaining a relatively even headway. And so there's this natural tendency that headway performance will be better than on-time performance. But we also know that our operations staff really focus on maintaining service headways in addition to on-time performance. So when buses and trains start to run late or really late, um, they're really working both to manage, both to get buses back on schedule, but also to keep the buses running regularly. And you can see that. Um, if we then layer on, we can also layer on 120% standard. This is really a, a, a tighter standard of performance, but again, it kind of shows that relationship between on-time performance and headway performance. I'll just show one other quick example of this then, which is um, uh, from our A-Line rapid bus service. And so um, what you can see here, again, are the same three lines of on-time performance in black, and then the headway performance of two different standards. Now, last summer, in 20, summer 2017, we had major construction over significant portions of this line, um, and uh, on-time performance suffered greatly. What we see here is that the headway performance, while it did decline, didn't decline nearly as significantly. And again, this reflects our ability to manage headway headways uh, to try to keep the service running as regularly as possible. Um, so the bottom line, you know, in, in, in using headway performance has been, um, it really has added an important perspective to our overall management of service performance. And it's also helped us to focus our conversations how to improve service performance. And now one of the best ways that we've found, of course, to, to improve service, and this came up in Matt's, Matt's discussion, is, um, is to have dedicated right-of-way. And so those familiar with the Twin Cities know about the Marquette and Second Avenue bus lanes. And both of these streets now feature double-width bus lanes that have significantly increased the, the capacity, the speed, and reliability of express bus service that operates there. And, and if you aren't familiar with this operation, it's definitely something to take a look at and maybe the subject for a future webinar. But what my point really here is, is how those two lanes, Marquette and Second Avenue here in the middle of the, of the map, how they work within the context, the, the broader context of the city. So this map is showing the express bus network, uh, in most of it in downtown Minneapolis. The, the local routes aren't shown here. Um, and what you can see is that, you know, of the, of the dozens of routes that we have operating, serving neighborhoods and park and ride lots across the region, um, there's maybe 45 to 50,000 rides a day on those routes. And the vast majority of those rides are, are served in this Mark II corridor, which is again, improved the performance for the service for those riders. Where we see the real challenge is where those riders are going into and out of the city. So here on 4th Street as riders come into the city or on 11th Street as riders come out of the city, I'll show some examples of what we're experiencing in those streets and how we're looking at that situation a little different matter. So again, digging a little deeper into this, this is an example then of 4th Street um, coming into downtown in the morning. Uh, and buses here are operating, coming off the freeway ramp, operating in mixed traffic as they enter into the downtown street system. So not only are they in mixed traffic, but they are also operating in the right lane, uh, which can cause delays if they're waiting for turning cars, you know, that are turning out of that lane, waiting for pedestrians to cross. And, and it varies from day to day as one of the challenges, but oftentimes that transit customer experience is, is, is they experience a significant delay 
just as about the, just as they're about to get to work can be really really frustrating. Uh, we have you know significant transit advantages on the freeway, and they get into downtown and they're stuck in traffic. And so this has really been an inspiration for us to work with our partners. Um, in this case, both the city and the state DOT um, to identify opportunities, you know, for improvements, whether it be dedicated lanes or queue jumps or other ways of keeping people moving. And in that work, you know, one of the key points that we have made is that while there's a lot of traffic here, buses actually only represent about 4% of the vehicles that are coming through this, this, this segment of street during that you know, AM two hour peak period. Um, and so when you count, the, but when you count the number of people on those buses and compare that to the number of people in the cars, a really different story emerges. Those buses are carrying over half the people in the corridor. So framed in this way, it's not just about improving the flow of buses that are only 4% of vehicles, but framing it as improving the flow of people on buses, which is again over half the person volume, is really an essential uh, part of ensuring that solutions are people focused. And just one other example, very really similar, um, this is an example of 11th Street heading out of town in the afternoon. And again, in this case, we have 4% of vehicles that are trying to squeeze into the two general purpose lanes that lead to the freeway entrance. And so again, some days it's just fine, and other days, just a, a, that backup in cars um, can get really intense, and we can have people that are sitting on our buses for 20 or 30 minutes trying to get through this congestion. And if we could move those buses, that 4% of vehicles more quickly, we could improve the, the overall experience, not just for transit, but for half the people that are using that corridor in the afternoon. So we can tell a similar story um, uh, on our local bus network and outside of downtown. So this is a map of the Hennepin Avenue corridor, which is a major north-south arterial coming out of downtown Minneapolis at the top of this picture. It's a busy corridor with um, both cars and transit with, with over 20,000 vehicles and 6,500 transit riders per day traveling through the corridor. And as with our experience in downtown, uh, just a small number of transit vehicles here, only two to 3% of traffic, moves 40 to 50% of the people uh, in the corridor during peak periods. And so um, I'll go quickly through this, you know, but really what we're using here is, is we're starting to use now the transit vehicle location data that we're getting from our buses every six to 20 seconds or so. Um, and um, using that to really look in fine grained detail at the speed of our vehicles as they're traveling through this corridor to really understand how they're performing and where there might be opportunities to improve that form performance again for that nearly half the riders in the corridor during the peak periods. Um, and so what we've done is using multiple observations of those speeds of the buses uh, we end up with an image that looks something like this, which is showing the speed of the buses. The red would be slower and the blues are faster service as the buses are traveling northbound or up in this picture uh, in the map. And you really can start to see where uh, there are delays due to signals or passenger loading, as well as that significant difference between the morning peak and the PM peak or the midday. And we really like that analysis so much that we actually have built an entire application around that um, for our users internally to use to really start to dig into this data because we're generating millions of rows of, de rec of data every day off of our buses. And this is what allows us to get at that data and use it. And we're able to filter by, by route and by time of day and by time periods to really start to see and, and again in fine grain detail. Um, some other visualizations of the same data. This is a, a, what we call a heat map, a speed heat map uh, along the um, uh, vertical axis, you see the direction of travel, and then along the horizontal axis is the time of day. Um, and here, where it's dark red, is we're seeing where the buses are slowing down as they are in the AM peak again. Um, and again, this is just a, another way that we can start to see whether there's variation by time of day uh, in that operation of our service. We've also combined this heat map concept uh, with uh, ridership information. So here again in the AM peak, we're seeing that that period of worst congestion where we're seeing the most slow service in the corridor is also the period of higher ridership, which again is inspiration to us and hopefully inspiration to our partners at the city to really to find solutions to speed up the transit experience. Because again, this is the transit speeds we're looking at, looking at speed up the transit experience as much as possible during that period. Um, just a quick, another example of how we look at that data. This is a, a visualization um, of uh, the speed 
on the route where we're seeing the um, on the horizontal axis again is the is the distance on the route, and the, and the vertical axis is the speed, um, and the and also we have vertical lines, the gray lines for the bus stops, and the red lines for for traffic signals. This this chart shows a, a summary of the entire day. We can really start to see the pattern of buses moving in between bus stops and slowing down for those bus stops and, and traffic signals. If we adjust this graph to show that variation by time of day, so here each line represents a different time of day, maybe I'll zoom in so it's easier to see. Um, uh, so the red line on the bottom there represents the AM peak. And so you really start to see then the difference in the speed, the slower speeds in the AM peak at that section of the route, not just at the bus stops, but even in between the bus stops. And that's really the value of this data is, to, is that fine grained understanding of what's going on. So just kind of in summary, whether it's, it's for service planners, operation staff, or traffic engineers, we're finding that data and, and the appropriate analysis and visualization tools are really providing essential insight into our operations and are providing a strong foundation for collaboration with our city and county and state partners. So in other words, the, the, the problems we see are multifaceted and so are the audiences and so are the performance measures and so are the data analysis tools that we use. Um, but substantive improvements in transit are possible, but they do require a collaborative approach or you might say teamwork. <laughs> um, and, and yes, they did manage to get the bus free. And with that, I will turn it back to uh, the folks at NACTO. Thank you, John. That's great. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to make sure to hand it over to Toronto so if they have time to talk, so I'll, I'll kind of abridge um, the intro. But um, I do want to note that please keep punching in the questions. We might not have as much time at the end of the webinar to answer those, but we'll uh, follow up with uh, some written answers in some uh, uh, intervening weeks. Um, so uh, I want to hand it over to, to David Cooperman and Scott Frazier, who uh, are both work with the City of Toronto um, and uh, have acted as uh, project leads on the King Street Transit pilot. Um, David is the manager of surface transit projects and the acting manager of operational planning and policy uh, with the City of Toronto. And uh, Scott is an evaluation and monitoring program lead and he works in the office of the general manager. So with that, um, I will hand it over to David and Scott. All right, thanks, Matthew. So we'll be talking about the King Street Transit pilot. And this is actually a pilot project that we already have underway. We started it in November of last year. And I'll just give a quick overview in the next slide of our presentation. So first, we'll just give an overview of uh, both our city and the pilot project. Then we'll go through, and Scott will be presenting most of the slides on the evaluation and monitoring program. Then we'll talk about some of the results that we've seen to date, and if there's time, questions and answers at the end. So first about our city. So Toronto is growing very fast. Uh, we have 228,000 more people here than we did a decade ago, uh, so very quick annual growth rate. And uh, we have fairly concentrated growth. The downtown is growing very fast right now, and also uh, we have a district in the north that's also uh, growing fairly fast. Um, over 80,000 new dwellings added to our housing supply over five years. And in the downtown, while it's only a small part of the city, about 3% of the land area, it accounts for half of the GDP of the city and a third of the employment, and about a tenth of the national GDP. So uh, a few words about why we chose King Street. Uh, King Street is a key arterial street in the goes through financial district and the entertainment district and other neighborhoods. Uh, it passes through the downtown core of the city, and uh, it's uh, so it's really passing through the center of the city of 2.8 million people and carries uh, at least last year before we started the pilot project the streetcar on the street carried 72,000 riders per day. So very high, the highest ridership surface transit route in the city. And for many years, uh, the streetcar service has been slow and unreliable. Uh, so we have seen bunching and gapping of streetcars and uh, travel speeds that are actually uh, sometimes slower than walking uh, during peak hours. Streetcars are also very crowded. And um, of course, traffic congestion, a major factor as well, with about 20,000 vehicles using the corridor each day. And uh, as the neighborhoods are growing and that population growth is happening, uh, we'll also probably see increased transit demand in future years. So while we tried a lot of 
sort of uh, quick operational tweaks and fixes, um, that wasn't really enough uh, to substantially improve service. And so we decided uh, in a collaborative effort, this is between um, our city planning division, transportation division, and our transit provider, the TTC, uh, we jointly decided to try out a pilot project with a different approach to giving the streetcars priority. So I uh, have to mention, we won't be able to go through everything today, but if you want more information, uh, we do have a project website for the King Street Pilot. It's right there, toronto.ca slash kingstreetpilot. So a bit about the design. So this is what this section of King Street looked like before. Uh, basically four lanes, two in each direction with streetcars operating in mixed traffic. And uh, one of the problems that we often experienced was left turning traffic, uh, waiting to turn left and blocking the streetcars. Also, uh, you can see that the streetcar tracks are kind of in the middle of the road. So they're not in the curb lane, they're in the second lane, the median lane. So what that means is that under this setup, uh, passengers would actually have to, cars would have to stop each time the streetcar stopped and opened its doors, and then passengers would have to board and they'd have to cross a live lane of traffic to board the streetcar. And uh, cyclists uh, without dedicated space would ride normally in the curb lane and they'd share it with traffic or uh, on-street parking and off-peak periods. Uh, of course, a lot of pedestrians in the area and not a lot of designated space for deliveries, uh, loading, or taxis. So here's just a, a shot of King Street before the pilot. So you can see a fair amount of traffic, some taxis, uh, streetcars operating mixed traffic. And the major change uh, that we put into place last fall was uh, giving transit priority uh, on this section of the street, which meant providing access for local traffic only. So we basically created a series of right turn loops. So at most intersections, the majority of traffic has to turn right. And also uh, we have banned left turns at all signalized intersections. And traffic uh, can use parallel streets tr through traffic that's going farther. So we do have uh, five parallel streets in the area that traffic can also use. And that's part of our uh, logic actually and our reasoning uh, to pick this segment of King Street because between, um, in this section, there are actually five existing parallel streets that could be used to disperse that traffic. Uh, there are some uh, exemptions provided to the no through movement rule at most of the intersections. So transit, of course, is allowed through. Uh, bicycles are allowed, emergency vehicles and maintenance vehicles as well. And also we have a taxi exemption. So after 10 o'clock at night until five in the morning, taxis are allowed to proceed straight through all the intersections. Also, uh, we were able to create some dedicated space for uh, short-term loading and deliveries, passenger and goods uh, loading. And also uh, we created some additional space for taxis. So an overview of the pilot design, you can see in the picture here, it shows the transit stops in kind of a red color and the, uh, the green shows public spaces and the blue shows loading zones. So importantly, we are now restricting traffic um, and allowing only local traffic access on the section of King Street. Generally, at most of these intersections, it's right turns only, no lefts. And the, uh, the streetcar stops are actually, the, the new platforms are actually in the curb lane, so they've been bumped out, or we've sort of put in a temporary bulb out uh, that allows for more direct boarding of the streetcars. And uh, of course, cyclists are also allowed to go through. No dedicated bike lane, but there is some space for them, if you can see between the streetcars and those curb lane uses, and they are allowed to go through the intersections. Uh, so a few considerations in the pilot, we wanted to use a uh, flexible and temporary design. So we didn't use any permanent materials. We knew that it could change uh, throughout the course of the 12 month pilot. And uh, also what that really meant was no significant construction period. So uh, the, the bulk of the construction actually happened uh, over a few days, over a weekend really in November. And so it was something that we could implement fairly quickly. Uh, we didn't pour any concrete. It was uh, basically concrete barriers, new signage, um, those types of materials we used. And there was, a, in, a, in advance, there was a public education and awareness campaign. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned, we put concrete barriers at the transit stops. So there are concrete barriers protecting waiting passengers from traffic. And a lot of the streetcar stops, almost all of them were moved to the far side of 
the intersection, whereas before they were at the near side. And that does two things. So one is it allows more direct boarding, so the, the passengers can more easily get onto the streetcars without crossing that lane of traffic. And also, uh, it facilitates right turns by that traffic that has to turn off up King Street. So we also created uh, some right turn storage. So you can see right turn lanes at each block. Uh, so those are various lengths depending on uh, the queues of traffic that we observed before launching the pilot. And those are actually being adjusted. And then we put in some accessible loading zones. So some of the loading zones were designated for vehicles with accessible placards. So um, this is uh, for people in wheelchairs, for paratransit, for accessible taxis. Um, they can basically use those spaces uh, for pickup and drop off. And the other loading zones are generally just for either commercial or passenger loading use. There's no on street parking at all uh, in this area. We took all 180 spaces away, but there is a lot of area parking. And within a five minute walk, we have about 8,000 spaces either uh, on side streets or off street uh, parking lots or parking garages. And we also created some public spaces. So the green in this diagram shows public realm spaces that were created. And those will be used for some, uh, some installations of seating, of public art, and also for outdoor cafe space for some of the businesses. So you can see just a shot of one of the intersections and one of the streetcar stops after implementation. So you can see that concrete barrier decorated, of course, to make it more attractive. And the yellow tactile strip uh, telling people that they can wait in that area. And to the other side of it is where cyclists and uh, streetcars and traffic would, would pass through. So a uh, major part of this study was an evaluation and monitoring program. So we decided right away that we would, uh, we would do more than we've ever done before on any study to really uh, observe and monitor and report the results from this pilot project. So uh, we have a, a very robust program uh, we're looking at measures of how efficiently transit is moving through the area. So we look at reliability, speed, and capacity. We're looking at uh, how many people in total can move through the corridor, and that includes uh, cycling and walking. And we're also uh, looking to create uh, or improve safety and accessibility on the street as well. At the same time, uh, we want to do this without uh, without harming businesses or the economic prosperity of the street. So we're looking at, uh, we looked at traffic impacts and uh, came to the conclusion that we could implement this pilot project without significant adverse effects on traffic in the overall road network. Um, we also looked at on-street curbside activity and for that reason put in some 24-hour loading zones to allow that to happen on the street. And uh, we're also, of course, engaged with our uh, partners at the police on enforcement to make sure that everyone understands how the street works and uh, so they can keep it working well. We're also looking at economic impact and sales in the area, um, making sure that that those levels are uh, comparable to other parts of the city. And uh, in addition, I mentioned the public spaces, but we will be activating the streets some more, especially once the weather gets warmer and giving businesses an opportunity to, uh, to do more to attract customers. And uh, additionally, we're looking at air quality and noise monitoring on the street, too. So we, we did a lot of engagement in advance of uh, putting the pilot into effect. Uh, we did some scoping of the study. We worked with uh, both business improvement areas and individual businesses. And uh, then we also decided, as I mentioned, to do an economic uh, impact monitoring component of the study throughout the 12-month pilot. So Scott will go into some more details now on how we're doing this monitoring. Yep. Thanks, David. So uh, as David mentioned, um, this pilot program is running right through the central core of the city. So we knew right from the get-go that uh, this would be a, uh, a program of high interest, uh, both politically and to the transit ridership themselves. So we really wanted to make sure that we had our bases covered uh, in terms of the monitoring and evaluation of the program. Uh, beyond that, uh, as a pilot project, we are committed to making operational changes and tweaks as the program progresses. In order to do so, obviously, we need the data to tell us what changes need to be made, uh, where to target them, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, when we were coming up with the data and monitoring plan for this, we really wanted to make sure that we were doing you know, best practice uh, as best we could determine um, to try to meet those goals. So 
Uh, whereas in the past, as part of a traditional approach, a project like this might have been um, monitored and evaluated through manual data counts, through maybe floating car surveys, uh, through um, people on the streetcar, you know, monitoring travel times through stopwatches or whatever the case may be. We really want to try to take a, a fresh and more comprehensive approach. So um, what we attempted to do was kind of embrace new sensing technologies. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the data collection and monitoring investments that we were making were going to have a legacy impact on the downtown to build our long-term strategy and ability to do these kinds of um, studies. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were being pervasive and permanent uh, to the greatest extent possible, automated and uh, open source. In the city here, we have a uh, absolutely fantastic uh, in-house data science team. We call it our big data team. We wanted to make sure that we were leveraging that uh, tool in our toolbox uh, to, uh, you know, we have a number of people who are able to dive into this and, and do a great level of detail. And wherever possible, um, through open data and also through public dashboards, kind of build confidence in the pilot through openness. So that by posting frequent updates, by giving people access to the information, uh, people can dig into it for themselves and develop a confidence in terms of what the city is saying is going on the street, uh, counteracted by what other people may say. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of been our approach overall. So I'm going to take you through uh, at a high level some of our uh, primary data collection techniques um, and then uh, kind of briefly cover some of our more minor ones. So uh, for, foremost, all of the streetcars that operate on the King Street Pilot area uh, have a GPS tracker on them, a GPS AVL system. And that allowed us to uh, directly track and um, analyze the impacts on travel times throughout the pilot. So uh, at each stop, as they go past, they were pinged. Uh, and that allows us to build a repository of travel time information that was 24-7, 365, essentially, going back both before the pilot and uh, throughout the pilot. Uh, in order to monitor video or um, traffic volumes, pedestrian volumes, uh, cycling volumes, we contract with a provider um, who was able to um, look at a permanent video-based counting solution. So, 360-degree uh, cameras that provide uh, an analytics or with an analytics package that goes over the top that does um, the sorting, the counting, classification. Again, 24/7, 365. Uh, and this is the kind of information that, again, gives us those volumes that also allows us to inform decisions on lane storage that we require, signal timing modifications, uh, and so on. So um, just a little quick uh, demo here, kind of highlighting uh, through a particular intersection the ability for the software to count, to classify, uh, to monitor various turning movements. Uh, so with this technology out there running 24-7, we get an incredibly robust picture in terms of what the impact has been on um, both vehicular and tra transit uh, vehicles. Um, in order to give us information not only on King Street, but also on the impact on the parallel roads, an entire grid of these were rolled out, uh, in total 32 detectors. So on King Street, it was fundamentally at every single <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, it was fundamentally at every signalized intersection and then uh, on the parallel routes at four of the major uh, north-south streets that act as screen lines for us. Uh, to capture travel times for vehicles, we deployed a similar grid of Bluetooth detectors. Um, so these are, again, placed at strategic locations, most of it uh, along King Street, again, at the signalized intersections, but then also at key uh, intersections for both the parallel and uh, north-south routes through, in and out of the down tour, town core. And this gives us uh, travel times um, on five parallel routes as well as a number of the north-south routes as well. Uh, in order to monitor the uh, impact on local businesses or the um, ability of them to maintain and operate, uh, unlike some uh, jurisdictions in the states where uh, you're able to access the uh, sales tax information. In Canada, that's not an option for us. So we contracted with a third-party provider, Monera Solutions, and they provide uh, the point-of-sale devices. So if you're at a restaurant and you pay with your debit card or your credit card, that machine the waitress hands you is provided by Monera. And through that, they're able to obviously get a picture of the sales volume that's occurring uh, in the area. So we have undertaken a comparison of the pilot area itself 
with a immediately surrounding control area based on postal codes or zip codes uh, in the US and then also an, uh, analyzing against citywide trends. So those are kind of our major uh, ones along with transit ridership. We've also uh, had a number of other factors that we're tracking including causes of delay, doing a bit of a deeper dive in terms of the uh, transit travel times. We've been monitoring parking utilization. Uh, in addition to the uh, intersection pedestrian counts, we've undertaken a few supplementary counts as well, uh, queue observations. We've been tracking obviously collisions and compliance as well, along with a number of the additional metrics that David had mentioned up front. Okay, so I just wanna mention that uh, it has been about four months or five months now since we launched the pilot project. And uh, we definitely designed it in a way that we would be tracking the results and responding to them. And that's exactly what we've done. So um, Scott's gonna go through some of the more, uh, the results to date uh, just now, but uh, I just wanted to mention that we actually um, are making some modifications to the design based on both the observations that we make, uh, the observations and the requests that we get from others, and uh, also, you know, if anything, uh, this is how we, through these results, we identify opportunities for improvement. And we have already started to make some changes to uh, signal timing and to some of the allocations of space uh, on each of the blocks. So um, all of that data collection obviously has to be, um, you know, analyzed and reported out on. So um, every month right now we are rolling out what we're calling our monthly dashboard which is essentially uh, interim results of the pilot to date across all of the various metrics that are being uh, analyzed so uh, just on the screen and i won't go through this slide in, in detail but um, it's a high level summary kind of looking at transit reliability travel times impact on cars impact on pedestrians cyclists just the full suite of everything we've been looking at and uh, david had mentioned the project website uh, within that project website is the dashboard itself, which you can obviously have a, a look through in more detail. So I'll go through um, a couple more slides here quickly just on some of the results we've seen so far. Uh, in terms of streetcar travel times and ridership, we've actually seen what we consider to be a pretty robust improvement. Um, in terms of the ridership across the area, we've seen a 16% ridership, as high as uh, 27 and 25 and 27 uh, percent at specific locations. And this has kind of been a, a cyclical relationship. As the operation of the pilot area has improved, it's driven more ridership, which has then driven our transit provider to provide additional plan capacity through um, increased frequency of service, as well as Toronto is recently uh, is in the process of replacing a streetcar fleet, and the new streetcars have a higher plan capacity. So as the ability to roll out more of these streetcars has come, there's been a better experience for the rider, which is driving ridership, which is, means that we're then driving additional demand on the transit network. So as I said, across the board so far, we've seen about a 16% uptick in ridership from uh, 72,000 to 84,000. In terms of the travel time, we've seen um, fairly, I think, encouraging improvements in terms of the Apple travel times, especially in the afternoon where we've had uh, improvements of about two and a half minutes in terms of the average, but probably even better has been the reduction in uh, extremely long trips. Uh, the range and reliability of our travel times has uh, improved quite quite strongly so far. In terms of vehicle travel times, we've uh, been monitoring this throughout the pilot and through the first four months, we've not seen a significant impact in terms of vehicle travel times through downtown. Uh, most routes have changed only plus or minus a minute or two. There's one on their uh, Front Street uh, westbound that's two and a half minutes or 2.7 minutes in this particular reporting period, but we've seen that come and go uh, over the first four months. This month, which was February, was up 200.7. It had only been 0.1 or something like that the month before, and I think it'd come back down again this time. So uh, it speaks to maybe a localized condition. Vehicle volumes, um, obviously on King Street where the through movements have been uh, restricted. Those volumes have generally shifted throughout the downtown core. We've seen slight increases on the other parallel routes, but then that has not resulted uh, generally in terms of a uh, travel time uptick. Pedestrian volumes um, so far four months in have followed uh, seasonal expectations. Uh, Toronto being a cold weather climate, we see quite a bit of a dip in terms of our pedestrian volumes over the winter. Um, which we saw there, especially in January. As we move further into the pilot, I think we'll see some of those 
uh, rebound and maybe even exceed the, the baseline, which was from the fall. Um, seasonality here is something we were really trying to track. As I mentioned, uh, economic point of sale information. Uh, so far, we saw the uh, in, there was an increase in um, economic activity in the pilot area from October before the pilot started to December, and that was generally in line with uh, seasonal spending patterns over the past three years. So um, we had a kind of a quick turnaround on this first set of data. This only represented the first uh, six weeks or so of the pilot. Uh, we will be getting a more, uh, you know, a, another update later in the spring here that'll have a little bit of a longer uh, look at it. So, okay, thanks, Scott. So, in summary, uh, the consultation that happened for this pilot was both with the public and with key stakeholders, and it occurred online, in person, and by mail. So, we used uh, all the means possible uh, to get the word out there about what was happening and to get uh, some input and feedback into our. Uh, eventual proposed design. So also it was implemented in November of 2017 and we are monitoring throughout this year to see how it works and as, as we both mentioned responding to those changes and looking at the interim results and uh, some of those changes I mentioned include signal timing, uh, changes for signal timing for all traffic as well as transit signal priority in some locations based on observations and we've seen improvements to the travel times and reliability to date, and uh, as Scott mentioned, without significant impact to the broader road network. And given our experience so far in this pilot and thinking ahead, of course we don't know yet if it will become permanent or if it will end at the end of the year. Uh, we will have a report going to council on that. But um, from our experience so far, we started thinking about our maintenance practices and given this is a very different design and layout for the street, um, it does come with its own uh, maintenance and operational requirements, especially when it comes to things like uh, winter maintenance and snow clearing. We have to take a slightly different approach, given that we're using the curb lanes very differently. And also, we're looking at increasing ridership, so it's a very good news story in that sense. We have a lot more people taking the streetcar and responding to these improvements, but uh, of course, uh, we do have limited resources in terms of how many additional vehicles we can uh, put on the street. And um, so we have to think about how to do that as efficiently as possible given those limited resources. And also, uh, I mentioned a little bit about the public realm activation. So in a few weeks, we're really going to get started with those outdoor cafes and other installations in the curb lane. And uh, we're going to start to think about, well, those are great things to have in the spring and summer. But then later on in the pilot, we're going to have to start thinking about what else can we do to activate the street. So eventually, as the weather gets colder, um, the outdoor cafe activity might subside and uh, we'll want to put something else in the curb lane to activate the street. So, uh, and, and of course, if it actually becomes permanent, we're going to have to think about how do we make the changes more permanent? How do we use more perhaps durable materials? Are there other design changes that we can make that we weren't able to do for this pilot project? So those could include things like uh, actual raised streetcar stop platforms, whereas right now we just have the concrete barrier and the tactile strip. Um, perhaps if it becomes permanent, we can actually provide raised concrete platforms there. And then uh, potentially, we, we have added a lot of signage uh, to make clear the new restrictions on the street, but if it becomes permanent, maybe we can look at some uh, some additional signage or maybe some changes to the signals. So so that, uh, that wraps it up, um, and we're open to questions. Great. Uh, thank you, David and Scott, um, both so much. Uh, thank you actually to both the presenters. So we've actually, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have noticed, we've, we've gone a little over our time. Um, so we uh, we actually won't have any time um, for questions during the call today, but um, for those of you who have submitted questions, uh, we will be following up um, with the presenters over the next uh, two weeks, and uh, we will be posting uh, a compendium to our website. So through the event page on uh, the NACTA website that you registered for, uh, we will have both the recording of this uh, webinar itself and uh, the uh, answers to questions that you all asked, um, uh, as, as well as the slide presentations. Um, so with that, I really want to thank uh, uh, David Cooperman, uh, Scott Frazier, and John Levin for their excellent presentations. These are such great examples of, of how uh, agencies are, 
are really doing in incredible uh, leveraging of, of data, of, of really comprehensive work uh, to talk about the benefits of transit and, and to really identify opportunities. Um, so with that uh, forthcoming, we're, uh, we are announcing uh, on May 24th, we have our next uh, webinar will be on emergency vehicle access and, and safe street design, and we're really excited about that one. It's a, a hot topic. Um, we'll be in Columbus, Ohio at the end of May uh, for our next Sister Cities Roadshow. Um, and then, of course, I want to call out that Designing Cities, our annual conference, will be in Los Angeles in October um, uh, 1st through 4th. Uh, so we, we hope to see you at, uh, at many of these events, and thank you all for joining today. Um, and with that, uh, we'll... Bid you a good Tuesday afternoon, and we'll talk to you soon.